T-minus 15 seconds and the sound suppression water system has been activated. On April 5th, 2010, Space Shuttle Discovery launched STS-131 to the International Space Station. Three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard Space Station. dynamic pressure. Discovery is already at an altitude of 4.7 miles or 26,500 feet. And traveling. Discovery, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. Traveling 1,000 miles per hour. Discovery's engines are now throttled back up and performing at full capability. Had lift off the shuttle weighed more than four and a half million pounds and now uh, one minute and 27 seconds into the flight the main engines and solid rocket boosters have reduced that weight by about half solid rocket bo rocket boosters alone are burn burning 11,000 pounds of propellant per second and the external tank is now 3,000 pounds lighter than when it began discovery is now 21 miles away from its launch pad and uh, 22 miles in altitude traveling 2,700 miles per hour. All three main engines are working just as expected. The three fuel cells are generating power and the three auxiliary power units are all producing pressure. In short, everything performing well. Two minutes and seven seconds into the STS-131 mission. And uh, from what we hear uh, on the ground, it was a spectacular launch uh, pre-dawn and there you see some time-lapse photography of it. This is the booster cloud lit up by the lit up by the sun just after sunrise. After achieving orbit, the crew used the orbital boom sensor system to check out the shuttle for any damage sustained during launch. There are sensors at the tip that we use to inspect the wing leading edge, and so we spend a great deal of flight day two doing that inspection. When the arm camera looks overhead, uh, we're able to wave through the windows and say hello to our friends and family back on Earth. And then when the inspection is done, we uh, place the boom back in the payload bay. After the standard two-day rendezvous orbit, on April 7, 2010, Discovery slowly approached the station. At just 400 feet from the station, Discovery flipped over doing the rendezvous pitch maneuver, allowing the station crew to take photographs of the tiles on the underside of Discovery. After performing the RPM, Discovery then slowly approached and docked with the station. Two inches. You see Very nice. Station. Uh, Houston and station. Nobody's capture nice. confirmed. The station and shuttle crews opened the hatches and said hello, got a safety briefing from the station crew, and then began transferring items that would be needed for later in that day and early on flight day four. <laughs> and then once we come across the hatch, there's lots of hugging, lots of hand slapping, lots of photography and videography, uh, but we're all very excited to see our friends on the station. 
On flight day four, Stephanie Wilson and Nakoto Yamazaki grappled and burred the multi-purpose logistics module Leonardo from the shuttle's payload bay. The rest of the crew began transferring cargo from the MPLM, with the first item being the rate gyro assembly, which would be replaced on the first spacewalk of the mission. The next day, April 9th, Rick Mastriaccio and Clayton Anderson performed the first EVA of STS-131. The pair released the new ammonia tank assembly for transfer to the station for installation on a later spacewalk. They also removed an experiment from outside the Kibo exposed facility and replaced a rate gyro assembly and performed several get ahead tasks. On flight day seven, astronauts Anderson and Mastriaccio performed their second spacewalk of STS 131, where they removed the old ammonia tank assembly from the S 1 truss and installed a new ATA. The pair ran into a small problem when one of the four bolts that holds the tank in place wouldn't tighten. They loosened the other three and tried them all again, and the fourth bolt finally worked. On April 13, 2010, Mastriaccio and Anderson completed the third and final spacewalk of the STS-131 mission, which included hooking up the ammonia and nitrogen lines to the new ammonia tank assembly, installing the old ATA in the shuttle's payload bay, retrieving some micrometeorite orbital debris shields, bolting a grapple bar to the new ATA, and prepping some of the cables on the Z1 truss and tools to be used during STS-132. On April 14th, the crew finished transferring equipment and supplies from the MPLM to the station, and the next day the MPLM was unberthed from the Nadir port on Harmony and placed back in the shuttle's payload bay. And then the other time that we have free time, we enjoy looking out the windows, and especially the brand new module, the cupola that STS-130 brought up. Um, here we're looking over a place that's near and dear to us all. We're coming up on a night pass over um, Houston and then uh, the Louisiana coast, and we'll come into daylight and eventually, in just a short amount of time, we will end up over Ireland, all in just a small bit of a pass, and it's just incredible to look at our Earth. On April 17, 2010, the STS-131 crew said goodbye to the Expedition 23 crew aboard the station, and closed the hatches between the shuttle and the International Space Station. Discovery undocked, and pilot Jim Dutton took control of the shuttle and performed a fly round of the space station. We backed out to around 400 feet and then began a lap around the space station that was just nothing short of spectacular for the views that we saw. We're used to seeing this in the simulator, and uh, this is the ultimate high definition, seeing it with your eyes. Um, here we are crossing by Lake Michigan and Chicago, straight down below the station as we were looking on it. And then you'll see here coming up on the Atlantic coast with Cape Hatteras, the furthest point off to the left. As we complete the fly around there, we see the station from the uh, backside and uh, looking at the horizon, it just was uh, one of those things that we'll all treasure for the rest of our lives. At Discovery Station on the big book, we have a great view of uh, Nader of the SM. Uh, you guys can come up to the overhead window and wave to us. Everybody wave. You taking pictures with the unit? Yeah. Here, get in there. <laughs> <laughs> Still a team, even when we weren't together anymore. They then said their final goodbye to the station and performed a separation burn. After two days in orbit alone, Discovery fired its engines to deorbit and returned to runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center shuttle landing facility in Florida. You get a great light show. This is a lights flashing out the overhead window, basically APU exhaust flashing out the overhead windows, while out the front window, the glow of the nose as you re-enter just forms all these different colors the hotter it gets. And then there's the tail glowing in the overhead windows. A couple of sonic booms as we come back to Florida, we had a great entry. Uh, 
over the continental U.S., northwest to southeast. Here we are flying around the heading alignment cone, Jim uh, taking his turn at the stick. And then uh, we rolled out on final. Jim got the gear down uh, right on time at 300 feet. And uh, this was a lot like training. Uh, brought it into runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center on a beautiful morning. Jim gets the shoot out and we bring the nose down and uh, roll out there on runway 33. Just a, a fun way to end a, a spectacular and, and very successful mission. On April 22, 2010, Progress M03M undocked from the Pierce. Filled with trash and discarded space station items, the Progress ship was used for scientific experiments until it was deorbited, entering the Earth's atmosphere and burning up over the Pacific Ocean on April 27, 2010. On April 28, 2010, Progress M05M launched from Site 15 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome atop a Soyuz U carrier rocket. Central time, that was 11.15 p.m. Baikonur time. It's carrying 2.6 tons of food, fuel, oxygen, air, and spare parts to the Expedition 23 crew. Uh, less than nine minutes after the launch, uh, Progress was inserted into its uh, early orbit, and its solar arrays and navigational antennas were deployed. After the standard two-day rendezvous orbit, Progress M05M approached the station. The Progress M05M was about a kilometer from the station, its KERS docking system failed, and cosmonaut Oleg Katov used the backup TORU system to manually control the rendezvous and docking, setting a record for the furthest distance a Progress spacecraft was flown under manual control. Katov was able to get Progress M05M to dock with the Pierce module. On May 10, 2010, Progress M04M undocked from the aft port of the Svezda module. Progress M04M stayed in autonomous flight for over two months after undocking to take part in the reflection geophysical experiment, studying the reflective characteristics of the freighter's hull and transparency of the Earth's atmosphere. Finally, Progress M04M was deorbited on July 1, 2010, over the Pacific Ocean. On May 12, 2010, Soyuz TMA-17 was relocated from the nadir port of the Zarya to the aft port of the Svezda module to make way for the Rosfet module coming up on STS-132. 